Thank you. Um, so this year we're talking about open source Mac management made easy. Last year I sort of showed modern open source Mac management, um, which was an improvement on out of date Mac management, but uh, certainly wasn't really easy. Um, I thought I'd just talk about SVI, St. Vincent Institute. Everybody says, what is that? Who are you? What, what do you do? Um, we, we look for cures for diseases. It's medical research. Uh, we've actually cured a disease, and this is our coolest uh, contraption. This is an isolator. You uh, take a donor pancreas, you whiz it up in a blender, you wash it, culture it, I don't know, do lots of processes to it, and they, they have these wonderful glove boxes that they stick their hands through and move it from one stage to another, uh, and they spin it around in a centrifuge, and out comes a uh, pancreas slurpee, uh, which then gets injected into your liver, and uh, you no longer have type 1 diabetes. You don't have to have uh, insulin injections anymore. So it's Pretty cool. Um, my part of that was putting the computer on the side, so that's very important. <laughs> Industrial control, it's the yeah. uh, We actually had to send that over to America to be validated by the company over there before they didn't use it, so it's a bit bizarre. So, start with some audience participation. Who is familiar with the uh, Mac management open source stack, as I'm calling it? So, probably about three or four people. I noticed in um, Peter's talk yesterday, he said he compared Monkey against Casper. I thought that was quite interesting. A lot of people make that comparison. But really, and I'm sure it's probably what you meant, it's not just Monkey. It's the whole suite of tools as well. Monkey's sort of like the flagship there. Uh, and so we'll go through that quickly. Anybody here actually using Monkey? One, two, three, four. About five people. It's cool. Is anybody using any other open source Mac management tools apart from Monkey? Auto DMG, Auto Packager, so yeah. So I'd say it's about half. Let's go. Cool. And who saw my talk last year? And yet here you are. Let's <laughs> go. So uh, this slide is my beautifully crafted diagram of what the open source management stack looks like. Um, some rather dodgy images. So. <laughs> It is entirely my own work, which is why it's so terrible. Uh, we start off with, <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty cool one for BSD Pi. Um, just how we, we take the image, put it on the Mac, get Monkey there, we have updates, and the Monkey does all the other stuff with it. We'll go through that um, pretty quickly, have a little turbo recap. I was hoping to do a montage with some cheesy music, but it uh, didn't quite work out. So. Um, how do we get a, um, a Mac image to begin with? Well, auto DMG, auto damage is affectionately known. Uh, Perelson, I think pretty people are fairly familiar with it. What you do is you get a Mac app store. This is last year's video, but a lot quicker. Uh, image, you drop it on here. It downloads the updates. And it actually installs the um, Mac OS X into a, a DMG file that it's created. So it's a virtual disk which has never been booted, uh, it's free of all cruft, and then we can deploy that as we, as we like. So it's a pretty cool way of preparing it. Once we have our um, DMG, we need to deploy it to the client. We're fairly imaging heavy here. And so we're going to use Imager from Graham Gilbert. And Imager is like a uh, pre-install environment. If you're familiar with Windows, it's a bit like Windows PE, but a lot simplified, and it's specifically designed to uh, image Macs. Uh, but to actually get the Macs to the stage of booting Imager, uh, we need to use uh, something that, um, some sort of netboot protocol, and this we have uh, here is BSD Pi from Papone Bruin. Um, this allows our Mac to um, pick up the uh, netboot broadcasts and then do a TFTP download of our Imager MBI file, uh, and then it will do the restore. Uh, Imager is a little bit involved. This is the uh, appeal list for Imager, and as you can see, this is our one here. We want to download from our website the DMG that we've created in Auto DMG. We want to install Monkey because this is how we bootstrap Monkey, and then a Monkey settings file. And then if we put this special file 
in here, it's a bit like the Apple setup done, it will um, run Monkey until there are no more updates. To actually make the MBI, we need to compile it, which is uh, a bit fun if you're not familiar with uh, how you do that. But uh, yeah, it's quite a, it's actually relatively straightforward uh, to compile. This then gives us the image of MBI. You can distribute that in other mechanisms like Deploy Studio or the NetSus appliance. But um, here we're going to use a uh, Docker container that uh, I think uh, Graham and Papine have come up with. And it will run a web server, a BSD Pi server, and a TFTP server all in one little command. And now we can netboot. Uh, I don't think this is real time because it's a bit slow. Yeah, OK, so we can just see that it's picked up the uh, BSD Pi, TFTP's kicked off. The Mac's now net booting. It's a lot faster. This is Imager. We can put in a little things uh, like the uh, name or number and the customized workflows. This then restores. And then we restart. Hey presto, we've got a freshly booted Mac. Once we've uh, got our Mac freshly booted, we then want to use Monkey from Greg Nagel. Um, all Monkey requires is a web server. It, sorry, all it has is a set of files on a web server. It has manifests. And it has catalogs. And catalogs are like a collection of package infos. It's important to note that the monkey client is really the brains of the installation. It makes the decision based on the manifest it's given on what to install. Um, there's no monkey server as such. Um, the server as it is just a collection of static files. Um, so to put that in context, if you're familiar with a, a Casper smart group, you, to do that in monkey, you can't do it on a server because there isn't one. Instead, you would have to apply your package to all of the clients. And then in the pack package itself, you'd put a conditional and say something like, if this is a laptop, install a VPN client. If it's a desktop, don't bother. So it's a slightly different way of working. Um, yeah, so you have a monkey client, which uh, says so tools, and then monkey tools itself, which is how we import our packages. And just to show that very quickly, um, this is a, a nice tool called Monkey Admin. It's a way of importing packages into Monkey. Let's drop on Firefox. It's a simple copy from DMG. It imports it, creates a plist, and uh, we can assign it to a catalog and set any installation scripts that might be necessary. That sets our home screen, uh, and so on. And yeah, and here we're just going to apply it to a manifest so that we can get it installed. Um, I am purposely whizzing through this, and don't worry if you're missing any of it. Um, Monkey Web Admin is a very nice tool for managing your um, packages. Monkey Admin, that like I showed you before, has a slight disadvantage in the fact that you basically have to aim it at a share or a collection of files. So it means if anybody's going to be making changes to your Monkey repository, they sort of need full access to all the files, which might not be great. Um, also, you may have technical support people who don't have Macs and they have PCs. And obviously, they can't run a Mac app for that, poor souls. Um, so Monkey Web Admin is a nice uh, Django app. And it will allow you to find um, manifest packages. So we'll find this, this scans through our Monkey repository. Let's find VLC, the latest version. As you see, it tells us all about the actual package. And now we can put it into a beta testing catalog, for example. And then if we wanted to, we could then apply it to an individual client manifest. Ah, there it goes. That shows you the underlying plist. So all of these tools are really designed so you don't have to deal with XML, which is quite handy. Yeah, so now let's just add that to our main SVI um, manifest. It's hard to know. Yeah, OK, cool. So this is actually Monkey Web Admin 2. It's only just been released, uh, or not really quite released. It doesn't include the reporting that Monkey Web Admin 1 did. So that's actually been removed, and he's just really focused on that side of it. Um, so if you want reporting, there's a second program called Monkey Report PHP. Uh, and it is, uh, just as you imagine, a nice PHP app. It, the, um, when Monkey runs, it has a post-flight and a pre-flight pre-install script. This is my, my work iMac, for example. This has all been passed up just before a monkey run. And so we get lots of um, useful information, warranty coverage, et cetera, et cetera. We can also see the uh, manifest that has been applied from monkey. Um, you can see that we've just done a VLC installation. It shows you what else has been installed. Um, we can actually watch it in action. Oh, no. So more reporting. Um, if there's not a report that you like, uh, you can easily make one, or you can try and beg somebody in the community to make one for you. 
Uh, as you can see, we've got some out-of-date monkey versions there, which is not good. Uh, this <laughs> nice transition. So this is actually a live um, way that Monkey works. It is um, just going to install VLC onto my Mac here. And so if we go back to Monkey Report PHP, um, Monkey's reported that firstly, it's got something to install, and it's a pending install. And then when we actually install it, it's going to tell us it's installed. So we can just see that that's now on there. So, uh, and if there was anything that went wrong during the installation, an error would have come up and we would have seen the error. Uh, auto package. I think it's important we note that auto package is not called auto patch. It's not patch management. Let's stop calling it that. It's package management. There's a big difference. It's not just for updates. It's also the way that you get applications in the first place. Um, so it, it's a lot more than that. So uh, if you look at um, auto package recipes, you just go along and you click the one, and it will get downloaded into your auto package. Um, so I've explained that badly. Uh, but even something like Microsoft Office, you don't have to download it from Microsoft to make your initial package. You can just do it straight from auto package, uh, which is really handy. If I actually show it, it might explain it a bit better. So um, this is auto packager, uh, which is a nice web, uh, sorry, a client for it from the Linde group. We go and select the repository that we want to download a package from. Uh, I'll just hit Java there, it's very quick. And now that has installed it. It sent me an email saying that, hey, I've installed Firefox. And now that's in our monkey repository. So that's pretty cool. It will do updates in a similar sort of way. Um, so this is basically looking at it all again. Here is the open source stack, and that is a absolute blitz through it. If you blinked and missed some of that, I suggest that you um, have a look at the AUC's excellent YouTube channel, and you'll see a guy a lot like me, but a year younger, um, kind of explain that in a bit more detail. So uh, I suggest you watch that. I just want to talk a bit more about Monkey, about how it works. It runs in sort of uh, two parts. Firstly, it downloads your manifest. Then it checks against the catalog to see what should be installed. And so it's discovered a couple of packages. And these are then installed, well, sorry, these are downloaded, rather, into library managed installs. And then a second process comes along and actually does the installation. Now, most of the time, this is completely uh, invisible to you because you'll, you'll run it from the, uh, the GUI, uh, the Objective-C client. You won't actually see the underlying part. But it's, it's quite important for the next part to uh, realize that it's a two-part process. OK, so we can slow down now. <laughs> imaging, imaging is dead. Um, I think we just heard a wonderful talk about that. Uh, and, and really, I think the, what people are unhappy about with imaging was this idea of monolithic images, gold masters. I think really the problem was they were quite hard to make is really the number one issue with them. And you, you needed to have um, you know, a not booted one. You needed to make them each time and manually install stuff. Is there a better way of doing it? Well, oh, no, I've skipped ahead of slide. Sorry. Um, why do we do imaging? Well, it gives us a known good state. It move, it, by putting an image, we also remove the iWork suite, which we don't want on our computers, which uh, may be a bit controversial. But uh, if our scientists submit their grants in pages, they won't get any money from the Australian government. So we remove the temptation. <laughs> Zero day support. Um, I think it's great that companies are interested in it. I'm not. If somebody has a slightly older version of OS X, it doesn't really impact their work. I'd rather have one that I know works with everything. Perhaps a bit old fashioned IT here, but from a business point of view, for, for my business, it's just not really relevant. So I would rather stick with the one that I know. Uh, and as Marcus alluded to, this MacBook Pro arrived in our office on Monday. And if you look at the, uh, the date there, it was born in January. So it came with 10, 11 free. So I'd rather have an up-to-date image. Providing I make my images fairly regularly, it's going to be vastly better than uh, letting that happen and sitting around. <laughs> We affectionately call that Apple time because, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would gladly race anybody to do an update um, versus a, uh, a straight imaging. I think we know what's going to be quicker. So, imaging is bad, if I repeat myself. 
we don't like the idea of monolithic images because we have to put a lot of things on there. There is some guy quoting himself uh, from this time last year. I don't know how meta that can be, but uh, it, let's only put OS 10 updates. I think I was a bit premature there, maybe even wrong. Um, you know, how lean do we want to keep the imaging? I think I'd largely ignore the concept of, Mac, of uh, labs because I don't have to worry about them. But there are other reasons too. And if you're wondering about companies that might be doing imaging, um, there's a very cool product that's just come out uh, a couple of weeks ago, sorry, a couple of months ago, called Auto DMG Cache Builder. And this is what Facebook are using for their application. So from Nick McSpadden uh, from Facebook. They obviously don't think that imaging is dead. Um, and so what Auto DMG Cache Builder does is it uses a monkey repository to download packages onto an auto DMG image. It's got an extra thunderbolt there for some reason. <laughs> I don't quite know what's going on there. Um, if it finds a suitable image, sorry, a suitable package, it will install that package into your auto DMG image. It's important to note that it, oh, that's why. Um, <laughs> it's important to remember that ADCB installs the package, Monkey isn't installing the package. Uh, and you're installing it into a rather strange environment. Uh, it's not like a booted Mac that's having the installation done to it. it. It is a virtual disk sitting on your desktop. So it's never been booted, first run hasn't run, there are no user accounts as yet. Also, because it's not Monkey, it can't do any of the cool stuff that Monkey does, things like post-flight, pre-flight scripts. You'd need to actually move those up a level and put them into your uh, packages. And also, Monkey has quite a bit of code to handle uh, difficult packages, <coughs> Toby. Um, so they won't run. You might think, well, that sounds a bit pointless. What's actually going to happen there? Um, am I really getting any saving? Um, but um, packages that aren't installed will be sitting on your disk image in library managed installs, and they will then get run by, they will get installed by Monkey on the first run of Monkey. So they, they won't get missed. Um, but you might be thinking, is that really worth it? And so they've come up with a clever way of dealing with it. So if you have something like Microsoft Office, which is about five or six gig, um, you might have thought, well, that's a single package. Well, it's not. It's actually a collection of packages. And most of those are safe to install because they are just sort of sandbox applications now. The only thing that really can't be installed is the serializer. And the serializer would, if you were doing this, run in the context of your Mac. So you would put the Mac, you would serialize it as in your deployment Mac rather than on the image, because the image can't be serialized because it doesn't really exist yet. And so by doing this, put in this exceptions list, all of Microsoft Office will get installed except for the tiny serializer part. So you've got a nice, you've got a big win, you've got five gig installed into your image, and then just this couple of meg program's gonna run the first time Monkey runs. So it's a pretty neat way of, of uh, fixing that. Your mileage will vary. You know, there are reasons for it. You may discover that if your package has a particularly nasty licensing, it's just not going to work for you. Uh, but for a great deal of packages, it works really well. So, you know, I don't think imaging is dead at all. And instead, it's been replaced by the rather affectionate T-shirt. You can buy these on Cafe Press, I think. Um, <laughs> Facebook's reasons for doing this, I, I spoke to Nick last week, is that they have between 40 and 120 new machines a day for provisioning and deployment. Uh, and a lot of like Marcus said, it's pretty slow. So they don't want, um, they, they want something that is modular, reproducible, but fast. And there's nothing faster than a block level disk image copy. Um, so it allows them to, to blitz through them a lot quicker. Um, Non-netboot imaging, we sort of touched on this. Maybe you have a wonderful network security team who wouldn't let you do anything as foolish as have your netboot packets go over subnets, because that would be terrible. Obligatory deal, but... <sighs> Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so to get around it, um, as we've already mentioned, uh, I think Vasco mentioned the uh, auto imager, well, no, so he mentioned auto imager Casper. This is from the same person, but adapted for auto imager MBI. And uh, it will, uh, you, you can take your imager installation, aim it at this, tell it where it's going to go to, and it will make you a restorable DMG. And so you can put this DMG, which contains what would have been on your netboot set, onto a USB, boot from a USB on the Mac, and then it will then pick up from uh, the imager a web server and download it. So there was no broadcasting 
needing to happen. Um, so yeah, we just create the netbook DMG, and then we can restore it. This is old disk utility, which you can get to run on uh, LCAP by opening it up in a hex editor and changing one word from 84 to 85, and it will now run. Uh, yes, I know, it doesn't look as pretty, but it, it works. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there we go, that's what Auto Imager does. So you can boot off your USB drive and then download from your Imager web server. So now let's turn it on my head. What's missing? What haven't we talked about that would be kind of good for open source stuff to, to do? Um, and I'd like to get some audience participation, please. And I have swag. I'd like to thank Charlie for the wonderful swag. <laughs> These are disposable static wristbands. So. <laughs> <laughs> and for the best answer, I have, I I'm not sure what this is for, but I reckon I can throw it quite away, so <laughs> I guess. Fire Vault. Fire Vault. Sort of the uh, key escrow? Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. Anything else? Oh, you yeah. Anybody else got anything that's missing? Sorry, I was shouting out. Okay. Anybody else? That's everything. Oh, so shout them out. APNS. Sorry? APNS. APNS. MDM. MDM. Anybody else? Marcus is going to get a lot of these anti static wristbands. <laughs> <laughs> so? Imaging through Wi Fi. Imaging through Wi Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> I had not thought of that one. <laughs> yes, no. No, don't. Jeez. Okay. Well, I'll see how I, I got on with, with mine. Um, uh, I think a few things were missing. Firevolt, Kiosco, DEP, MDM, training, certification, scalability, multicast imaging, unifying iOS, Mac management, VPP. Um, I didn't have imaging over wireless, I'm afraid. <laughs> and then local firevolt either. Um, so just to blitz through, oh, and of course, what this tool is called? It's not, I haven't really made anything easy yet. VPP, monkey can install non-app store receipts validation apps. I don't know what that means, but if that means something to you, then monkey's not for you. Um, okay. Training. AMSYS now run a Monkey 101 course. That's pretty cool. They've only started doing it. Uh, for people in Australia, it might be a bit tricky because they run it in two locations. They have it in South London and Central London. But I think... <laughs> I, think <it's> <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of those things, if it's successful, it will take off. Um, Certification, I spent longer than I'd care to admit trying to come up with uh, funny names for monkey certifications. Uh, <laughs> and didn't come up with any. Um, I asked this question at our um, Melbourne Mac Admins uh, meetup a few weeks ago, a few months ago, and said, what's the number one certification I would like to see from somebody applying for a job with us who's going to be a Mac system engineer? And somebody who wasn't there perhaps would like to have a guess at the number one certification? No? Somebody who was there, do they remember? Yeah. Do you know what? The, the Mac side of it's quite easy. It's the running the Linux servers. It's the hard part. Um, not being abstracted away from that. So it's a bit out there, but uh, certainly if you're going to move into serious Mac system administration, I think it might be a pretty vital thing to be, for people to get. Um, scalability. Um, this is Greg's take on scalability um, in his own wonderful style. <laughs> Um, Guy said, is there any automatic scaling tools for Monkey? And the answer is no, and nor will there be because I couldn't write a better version of rsync. Um, Monkey runs off a web server. Web servers, the scalability has been solved. They've been around for you know, 16 years. We'll have a long since the web was invented. There are plenty of ways of doing it. You might think, well, how hard is it to sync a Monkey repository? Um, I was, bizarrely enough, on Reddit, r sys, Mac sys admin, and Flap to the future. It just came up with this little one line. It said, this is how I sync my monkey repositories. 
It's really not that hard. Stick that in a cron script and it will update it every hour, every day, whatever you like. So um, you can quite easily uh, create scalable monkey installations. Um, multicast imaging, not really going to work with HTTP. The sort of protocols don't really match. Um, I think for the moment you're going to have to scale instead. FileVault Kiosco. Um, Cauliflower Vest has been out for a while. It's a Google app engine. If you think anything I've shown you is hard, um, this will be quite a shock about <laughs> the level. Of, it's pretty tough to set up, but it is very fully featured. It will do uh, FileVault Kiosco. It will do BitLocker, Key Scrow, I guess, and also Lux, which is the Unix, Linux unified key setup, which I hadn't heard of. Um, the name, if you're wondering, comes from, it's an anagram of file vault escrow. So that's very clever. Otherwise, there's uh, Crypt2 from Graham Gilbert. And what Crypt2 does is it's a Django app, a Django web app, and a little Objective-C client. It just runs and enrolls your keys in there. Depending on your needs, um, there may be a slightly easier version of just management. And instead, you can encrypt using a file vault institutional key. Uh, and basically there, rather than the Mac picking a random key and then giving it to you, you instead say, use this key to encrypt. It does mean that all of your Macs are using the same key, or perhaps you might slice it up and have certain sections of Macs having it. Some people say that's pretty insecure. I sort of wonder, you know, do you have the same admin password on all of your Macs? If you do, it's no different to that. Um, but, you know, your mileage will vary. We only actually encrypt on request because, you know, if you spoke to our scientists and tried to get their most deepest secrets of what they're researching, the trouble wouldn't be getting them to talk, it would be getting them to shut up. So <laughs> the fact that the, the prospect of them actually losing anything is, you know, so if, if, if something went wrong with their, their drive and it wasn't backed up and so on, they'd, I think they'd be complaining, so why did you encrypt it? I didn't want you to encrypt it. Uh, you know, so maybe this decision will be made for us with a new file system next year, but for now, um, these are your options. Mobile device management, MDM. Mobile devices. Which one of those is the mobile device? And yet we manage the air in the same way we manage an iMac. It, uh, it's a bit tough. It's one of those things, you know, I think, I think we'd say, I know a mobile device when I see one, but it doesn't quite work out. Um, Wikipedia actually has a good definition. A mobile devices such as laptops and desktop computers. So by that definition, Monkey is an MDM. Um, if you talk to Greg Nagel, I think he explicitly denies that it's an MDM, but hey, Wikipedia says so, so <laughs> there you go. Um, so I guess when we're talking about MDMs, are we talking about iOS management? Maybe, maybe not. And if we're really looking in the mobile space, what about, as my colleague Brian affectionately calls his freedom phone, or <laughs> Windows, which I don't know. Um, so we, we perhaps need to take a look at that. There are actually a few open source MDMs out there. WSO, Enterprise Mobility Manager, is a, kind of like a freedom, freemium um, Java MDM that you can enroll Windows phones, um, Android, and Macs. Um, Project IMAS was from... I think a black hat, they all hacked it together and then Papine Bruins giving it a go. It's not really meant to be used, but it's pretty good as a reference. Um, Commandment, open source MDM from Jesse Peterson, he's the guy behind Margarita, which I didn't show today actually. Um, and that is yeah, basically a Flask Python app that uh, will do a lot of the, the open source stuff for you. And then new, fairly new on the market, micro MDM from Groob and uh, very soon a front end from Mosin up there. <laughs> Largely what that is uh, particularly good for is getting the, um, the agent, the monkey agent, onto your Mac. So it doesn't really do much more than that, but it's, uh, it's pretty good. Also, if you want to use an MDM yourself, you need to have an Apple Enterprise certificate, which can be a bit hard to get if your organization doesn't really have one, as you need to be a member of the Apple Enterprise uh, scheme. So um, Jesse Peterson has kindly taken his Apple Enterprise certificate and will sign your certificates with it. Um, potentially a little bit risky because that might get shut off at some point, but if you uh, are struggling to get a Enterprise cert, then uh, that link there shows you where to get it from. DEP. Um, I'm quite glad that Marcus sort of bashed DEP a little bit because normally we only hear good things about it. Where does it fit in our stack that we're talking about? 
well, it would replace the monkey installer. Um, but it doesn't make sense because DP can only get installed once the Mac is booted, uh, the first run is gone, and a user account's on. So, yeah, it's just not really working. Instead, we'd have a situation like that. I don't really like that because then we take away all of the good things about imaging. Uh, furthermore, we bind to AD um, for our own sins. Um, if with DEP, the user has to create their own account. So, although it may bind to AD after the fact using a monkey package, the user's not going to log in with that account because they've just made their own one to begin with. So, it doesn't quite make sense. Um, as we know, it's an unknown version of OS 10. You can't really use the Mac until the apps are installed. Um, I just look at going back to the stack and seeing all of those huge downloads. I wouldn't want to do that over Wi-Fi, even in our office. Uh, you know, it's got to be over Thunderbolt downloading a 50 gig Creative Cloud installation. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not totally sold. Maybe it's this old-fashioned IT mentality, but I, I don't really like that. Um, so what we need to give is for at SVI is our out-of-box experiences. It just works. Um, I mean, I was totally blown away when Dean Hagen showed his little post-it note on his new Mac at uh, Jamf Roadshow last year, and he, he sort of walked into his office. There was his new Mac post-it saying, "Enroll here, love IT." I think that's amazing, and for the right company and the right culture, it's brilliant. If I did that to my director, I'd probably come back from lunch with a post-it note saying, "You're fired." <laughs> <laughs> but people, people just don't want them to have to set up their Macs. You know, as we said, that is kind of our job. Maybe it's cultural, maybe it's age, I don't know. Perhaps the younger generations are going to want to have more control. And, and certainly if you're more of a developer sort of company, then that's a, exactly what's going to happen. But for us, it just isn't going to work. However, this was not, you know, what's John's opinions on DEP? Can we do it? Um, there are a couple of tools for doing it, as I mentioned before, micro NDM, but also Pi came up with the Depi, Depi which is a way of interfacing with um, Apple's DEP servers in Python so that you could put that on your own server and then get it all together. Once again, I haven't really made anything easy. Well, how hard is it to set up any of these things? If you're not familiar, you've only been in that crowd, you might be wondering, is it that hard? Um, I'm going to pick on Monkey Report PHP because I think it's a great application. Um, so this is their instructions on how to set up the server beforehand, before installing monkey report PHP. First, set up the server. And what they're saying there is you will set up your server, set up the networking, install Apache, install MySQL, get clone that down. It's not particularly you know, friendly if you're not familiar with setting up web apps on, on Linux. Um, for the purpose of this talk, when I was uh, setting up Monkey Report PHP on my test VM, uh, I spent an hour trying to fix up mod rewrite, um, which is, yeah, I was going to laugh, that's cool. Um, basically, that's the part that removes index.php from the URL. It's a bit silly, but uh, I was doing it in a new way, and I spent this time restarting Apache constantly. It's even somebody who, like me, who knows what they're doing, apparently, um, I got stuck for an hour, and I think if you were trying to test something out, that would really put you off. But again, how hard should it be? If we're setting up a system to manage 5,000 Macs, you'd be a bit surprised if it was easy. We do need to you know, figure it out. You need to figure out and solve a lot of problems for that. But what if we did just want to try it out? What if you thought today, oh, I quite, a bit, quite like one of those tools. I want to give them a go. How can I do it? Um, well, the first, I think, stab at this was from uh, Tom Bridge, Monkey in a Box. Basically, it will set up for you on your Mac, providing you have the Mac server application. Monkey, a web server for Monkey to use. Monkey report, Monkey enroll, and auto packager. Um, I'm not going to run it. Instead, strangely, I'm going to look and show you what it looks like on GitHub. Um, so if you download this script and just run it, you will get all of that. Uh, it's not going to work for production, but it's a great starting point. And so you might look at it and say, hmm, I rather like some of the parts here. I might use those in production. Yeah. And it just keeps on getting better over time, uh, definitely. So more and more comes there. So if you run that, you'll have a fully working monkey server ready to go. Cool. 
really it'd be good if we could take away a lot of the operating system sort of side of it. It goes on forever. Um, so a lot of Mac admins are now looking towards Docker, and I thought I might have a crack explaining what Docker was, and then I decided that no, I don't think I will. Uh, I, I think this speaks for itself, and if you don't make sense, then maybe this diagram will help. <laughs> Basically, um, <laughs> sorry, no. um, what, to broadly explain what Docker is, Basically, rather than having a hypervisor and a guest OS installed into your, in, into your VM, and sorry, rather than having a virtual machine that you have to install a guest OS, instead, we just have the Docker engine and run straight on that. So if you have a virtual environment that has 10 Linux servers, 10 Mac servers, that means that you've got 20 installations, or 10 of Linux, 10 of that, and 20 installations all sitting there. With Docker, you just have a single installation, and you run a script, and it sort of does a compartmentalization for it. Um, I'm sure that made no sense, uh, and I asked, uh, again, my colleague Brian, I said, do you have any way of me explaining how to manage Docker containers? And he said, yes. I... <laughs> May... <laughs> Maybe a video is what we need. <laughs> so <laughs> um, you can now get uh, Docker for your Mac. Uh, only recently it's come out, it's still beta. This is how we can set up monkey report PHP. Uh, we pull the actual Docker file that somebody else had created for us, and it downloads, this is all in real time, and then we run the docker command, like so, and there's about 200 different uh, Mac admins uh, docker things knocking around. Run that, and that's it. We've now got monkey report PHP set up and running. Um, it, you know, literally took 30 seconds to, to set it up. Um, this one doesn't have any clients reporting to it, but uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, and likewise, Monkey Web Admin, I found pretty horrific to set up the first time. It's a Django application. It runs in a virtual environment for Python. If you're not familiar with that sort of thing, it's not much fun. Um, however, to set it up using Docker, again, we just pull down the Monkey Web Admin, run the command. Uh, I kind of mangled that because it didn't quite work copying and pasting it. but. Um, Run that, and again, we have a fully working monkey web admin instance. Again, there are no files, so it's not there. Again, you probably shouldn't just be taking these Docker files and running them in production, uh, and, and you're just running Docker itself. Oh, sorry, yeah, it hasn't got a thing. Running Docker itself is not necessarily that easy, but just to try it out, it's fantastic. So I'd recommend that you do this, install Docker on your Macs, and then have a look at those uh, various uh, things on the Mac admin's uh, Docker hub where you can download that from. Uh, it's pretty cool, and what you can also do is look at the underlying um, Docker files that you saw getting pulled down, and then adjust them and change them and suit, uh, so that they suit your needs. Uh, it's definitely the future. VMware soon will allow containers natively, um, which will mean that you don't have to run a VM, you can just put them straight in there. It's only gonna get better. What about the future? Uh, how can we make it easier? I, I sort of had envisaged for this talk that I might have a, a VMware virtual appliance that would have all of this stuff in there, and you would just be able to import the appliance, but I kind of thought, I don't know, is that really what people want? Does it need to be that easy? Perhaps Docker will do it for us. Uh, I'd be interested to know what people's thoughts on that are. If, um, if you've thought about looking at the, the open source stack and have been put off by a particular sort of complexity that you didn't like, I'd be interested to know from people and to see if there are solutions that we could perhaps do. But otherwise, that it is for now. Do we have any questions? Ms. Marcus. Do you have any issues in your organisation choosing open source tools over commercially available tools? Open source is free. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we kind of can get away with doing pretty much what we want to um, because um, the boss. Uh, so, no, is the answer. Yeah. Um, there's no issue with that at all. You, you haven't ever been asked to sort of justify or provide information about the security or the background of the stuff that you're running on machines? Every year um, our insurance company comes back and does an audit and we ship them a list of all of the uh, files that we have on there and we never hear from them again. So... I guess we're covered. <laughs> they clearly understand everything you're doing and yeah, no, know no, that no. it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs>
You just like seeing me run, don't you? <laughs> Have you ever done a, uh, a cost analysis on the time you guys actually spend setting up all these tools, training, compared to what it would actually just cost to buy a commercial tool? Um, I see other consultants that they'll kind of push free services like Monkey to their clients mm -hmm. because it's free, but then I'm going to, or they would, overcharge on consulting time. And it's like the soft cost compared to the long-term costs. Have you ever done that analysis? Uh, no, I mean, it's a very good question. You know, what is the total cost of ownership? It's, a, it's sort of almost a very Microsoft concept that they used to run back in the 90s saying why they were cheaper than Linux. And, and you're right, um, the actual software licensing cost can be a small component compared to it. I think where we're seeing Monkey get a lot of action is really in big com companies where they can take it and run with it and adapt it to work with their own needs. Uh, you know, it is open source. They can make changes. They can understand what's going on. You know, they, so they run it at Google. If there's a problem with a bit of Python, they have the guy who wrote Python working for them. So they can go to there and get him to fix it for them. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a very good point. It is something that when you're looking at any open source, you do need to consider the cost. Um, for us, we often say that we are time rich but uh, cash poor. Uh, and so even if you know, a staff salary comes out of a different pot of money rather than uh, OPEX. Or, so it, it was hard to justify it any other way. Just a, a follow-on from that. It's, how do you also deal with kind of keeping all your staff trained? So one of the things I see with open source software is there's always one guy that's the source of knowledge and he goes off and has paternity leave or gets hit by a bus. Mm. What happens then? Uh, it's a very good question. It's something we've been dealing with uh, recently about. Um, we, we run a, an open source just mail server called Zimbra, and the only person who knew really how to run Zimbra left at the beginning of the year. And we've been scrabbling around and looking to move to 365 to get away from it. Um, with a lot of the, the Mac stuff, though, it, it kind of is fairly self-explanatory. As long as you have the Linux skills, it's generally not a problem because it is just Linux servers running Python scripts. So as long as I think you are of that mindset, you generally don't have a problem because you should be able to troubleshoot it anyway. Um, packaging is probably harder than all of this, I'd say. You know, so that would that, be the biggest skill I think people need to really do to do this. But no, it's a good point. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, do you know, is, is there kind of a, a, a local um, support, not, I mean, not oh, obviously not official support, mm -hmm. but some kind of, you know, support group that you guys know of um, that can help uh, anyone get started with this kind of stuff? Or? Um, well, the, the local Mac admins meetups are probably a good bet. Um, we, we do in Melbourne every other month, and if people were interested, um, we could certainly have run something there. I know that Aaron is a fan of Monkey as well and runs the Sydney one, so I think there's a good chance that he'd be prepared to do something similar there. Um, I, I think a lot of the time is, you know, you, you kind of think that these events, are people interested in it? But knowing that people are, you know, actually gets people to do it. So put it out there. I think that people are interested and you'll, you'll find more people who talk about it. Um, it's been quite a few years since I last looked at Monkey. Um, so the, the web server is basically just a web server and the, the agent does all the heavy lifting on the clients. Yep. Um, how does the, the PHP report app work? Does that run a separate agent to gather inventory information or does the agent make yeah, the agent sorry, report? Rather, rather blitz through that. So um, Monkey, um, the Python scripts, when you run Monkey install, what it does is it, um, it has a post-flight script an error script and a pre-flight script. And at the pre-flight script, basically, um, you download from Monkey Report PHP uh, a rather large shell script that gets run and it collects all of the system information and everything that's there. Uh, and it's kind of the, the pre- and post-flight scripts are kind of the same, and it just compares the difference. And it just curls it back up to the Monkey server. And obviously, the error script, if something goes wrong, Monkey throws an error, and then that gets reported back. But that's the way that hooks up there. Can you actually do real-time reporting? Um, we need to kind of know exactly what students are on what labs at, at a certain time. Would Monkey be able to pull that off? Uh, so Monkey 
runs in the background according to a schedule you set. I think it's by default about every half an hour it checks. And if there's nothing there, then it just doesn't do anything. But if there is, but each of those times it will be polling back to um, Monkey Report. And so, yeah, you can, uh, I think it's, uh, there's a defaults right you just run and you can change how often it runs. So you could set it to be like every five minutes if needed. Okay.